we need a wiser concept of animals. They're not brethren. They're not underlings. They are other nations, caught with us in the net of life and time. Henry Beston, 1935. For eons, the Barunga volcanoes of Central Africa have sheltered denizens from our past. Surrounded by a misty veil, our distant cousins dwell in a cloud forest sanctuary. They are known as Ngagi, the mountain gorilla. Today, the peace of their sanctuary is uncertain. The rumbling of human desperation thunders through the hills. Competition for land rules the day. And at times, conflict breaks into the gorilla's backyard. In this land, mountain gorillas and mankind travel together on an evolutionary journey, competitors and companions in the quest for survival. The survival of our forest cousin is a tribute to the dedicated people who have struggled to save them. They are truly living on the edge. Mountain gorillas are our kin. We probably share 97, 98% of our genes, which means that most of our passions, emotions, imagination, everything that we have, to some extent, gorillas share also. So if you meet a gorilla, you're not just meeting an animal. You're meeting a being that is very close to you. And you cannot but help wonder when you look at each other's eyes, the gorilla's eyes are gentle, kind, vulnerable. You feel drawn into them. Does the gorilla sense the same thing when it looks at you? One wonders. Do gorillas dream of their forest? What goes on in their mind? It's the kind of thing a biologist wished he could delve into but all he can do is get hints. There can be no doubt that mountain gorillas would not exist today were it not for the efforts of Carl Akeley and those who have followed his spirit. Akeley was the first to recognize the importance of preserving and protecting one of our relatives from the past, the mountain gorilla. Akeley did not think it fair to future generations to exterminate an animal of such intense human interest as the gorilla. He not only wanted to establish a sanctuary for the mountain gorilla, but also a biological research station where they would be studied. In 1925, Akeley's efforts were rewarded with the creation of Albert National Park, the first national park in Africa. The sanctuary was created in the interest of humanity as well as science. Mountain gorillas would be protected. After Carl Akeley's death in 1926, important questions about mountain gorillas remained unanswered until 1959, 
Professor John Emlin of the University of Wisconsin and George Schaller ventured into the Virungas. Their mission was to initiate the first long-term field study of mountain gorillas. I had read about gorillas and I was impressed that they were approachable. George was a student of a friend of mine, a former student of mine, and she called me up one day and she said, John, I think we've got the ideal person for you to take to Africa. But she said, don't tell George your idea of the gorillas because he'll hit the ceiling. And so I carefully kept the idea of a gorilla trip quiet. And George came to me as a student. So when I finally mentioned possibility to him, uh, he was very excited. And he said, when do we go? <laughs> In 1959, our goal was, for the first time, to learn about the natural history of gorillas. What were their lives really like? But even back then, a basic purpose was conservation. We were concerned about the future of these animals, which were known to be rare. What has to be done to protect them for the present and for the future? So you had a dual goal to our work. George Schaller and his wife Kay settled among the gorillas. They lived in a mountain meadow called Kabara, near Akeley's grave. The Schallers felt Akeley's spirit and were acutely aware that they were turning Akeley's dream into reality. Over a period of 20 months, they spent more than 400 hours observing mountain gorillas. In 1960, Schaller estimated that 450 mountain gorillas lived in the forests of the Varunga volcanoes. He sounded a warning that continued vigilance was necessary to ensure the gorillas' survival. Stimulated by Carl Akeley's vision nearly a century ago, many international scientists have carried on Akeley's mission, studying and protecting this magnificent being. <clears throat> Today, the challenge is no longer the conquest of nature, but conservation and preservation. It reminds us that both our knowledge of the world and our attitudes about it can change. Humans are, of course, just one species among 80 million or more species. Yes, uh, we have the most impact on the environment than any species, but other species have, in their own way, evolved just as importantly. They have equal importance as an evolutionary product that is adapted to their environment. You can argue that we are maladapted. No other species destroys so much of its environment so rapidly. So I think people need to view themselves as part of nature, as part of this great being which some consider the whole Earth. The value of a, of a spectacular species like um, a gorilla, a mountain gorilla, or, or uh, a sequoia is multiple. First of all, uh, it serves as a flagship uh, by which the importance of the environment uh, in which it lives is emphasized, such that uh, as a result, the species being saved protects the environment. And with it, very likely, I'm, I'm sure this is the truth for the Varunga Sanctuary, uh, tens of thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands of other plant and animal species, a large number of which would disappear if the, uh, the, the mountain forests were eliminated altogether with the gorilla. So the gorilla stands as a kind of symbolic guardian. As scientists witnessed the disappearance of the natural world, many turned to active conservation. And the thing that struck me and got me probably thinking more specifically about gorilla conservation early on 
was teaching biology class to 10th graders in high school um, in Zaire and them asking what I thought of their area and all. And I said, to, you know, this is an amazing place and I'd love to come back and study gorillas. And one of the students asking me why I didn't study gorillas in my own forest in North America. And I was floored at how little information people had. And when I started to talk about the fact they were only found here, this is the only place in the world. Um, you could, some kids actually sat up straighter in their chairs. Um, some you know, leaned forward, raised their eyebrows, and they had never heard this before. And you really could see them <coughs> beginning to say, wait a minute, and this is ours, this is special, and we should be involved as well. And that was the beginning, I think, of a lot of our thought on a number of different ways to approach conservation here. One innovative idea was called ecotourism. The concept of environmentally friendly tourism was to take nothing away from the land but memories and leave nothing behind except footprints. Tourism would help fund wildlife conservation programs. And mountain gorillas emerged as Rwanda's main international attraction. Travelers from all over the world trekked to the Virungas to meet their cousins in the wild. <laughs> Your experience is really going back in a time machine and uh, basically looking at yourself five million years ago or ten million years ago and uh, and no noticing that you still have this kinship, that you're not unrecognizable. So when you see them, you see a face appear behind leaves or something, and it looks like Uncle Joe. You see that you recognize the kinship. They no longer seem really a different species. They seem the same species, maybe a little hairier, a little bigger maybe, uh, but the, sim the differences tend to be forgotten. People see themselves reflected in animals. The gorilla is a perfect example. To some it is a ferocious beast, to other it is a creature beyond themselves. It has arrived from the past in human shape, but it lives its own life completely coherent as families, as an evolutionary fact. And to try to explain this life, to see this creature so much like yourself, I think conveys a certain transcendence that draws you to the animal, that wants you to make contact with it. Gorillas are social beings. Their culture has strict rules of behavior. Visitors are instructed to follow rules of gorilla etiquette. What we know about gorilla etiquette is largely through the work of Diane Fossey. She defined the rules of gorilla etiquette. When entering the gorilla group, you have to be aware of body language, and we call that the gorilla etiquette. You don't want to surprise the gorillas. You want them to know that you're coming into the group. You want them to be calm. So as we're moving in, what we'll do is we'll make gorilla vocalizations. They're called contentment vocalizations. The gorillas do this when they're eating, when they're happy and calm. And what this is is like a, a low throat clearing sound. And it kind of sounds like <clears throat> And what that does is it tells the gorillas that someone is coming into the group. And what I like to think is it says, I'm over here, gorilla, and I'm a friend, and I'm coming in. It seems to work when we do this. It keeps everybody calm and we're actually able to go into the gorilla group. The next thing that you want to be aware of is direct eye contact. You never want to make prolonged direct eye contact with a gorilla. To a gorilla, that is a threat gesture. So when we go into the gorilla group, what we'll do is we'll come in, we'll make brief eye contact with the gorillas, and then when they turn and make eye contact with us, we'll turn away slightly, just briefly, and then we'll come back. And normally when we come back, the gorillas will look at you just for a second or two, and then they'll turn away, and they'll do what they're, they're doing. Beyond that, uh, you never want to 
have arms extended away from your body. It could be seen to a gorilla as a weapon. You want to keep your arms in close to your body, keep your movements very slow. You don't want to be moving around too fast. You don't want to show your teeth. Showing teeth is potential aggressiveness to a primate. Those are the basic rules of gorilla behavior and gorilla etiquette. And if we pay attention to those, it's a very a respectful interaction you're having and it keeps everything very calm. <coughs> Through a strange twist of fate, mountain gorillas and people are companions and competitors in the quest for survival. Rwanda is the most densely populated country in Africa. It is also one of the world's poorest. Over 90% of Rwandans live on small farms, eking out a precarious existence. Each year, more families cry out for new farmland. <laughs> One day I was in the jungle and I was filming the clouds moving over Mount Makena, which is one of the volcanoes there. And I was right on the border of Zaire, right on the border of Rwanda and Zaire. And I was standing out in this meadow and I was all by myself, There's nobody else around. And from time to time it, it can be dangerous up in that area. And I was looking through the viewfinder and I was thinking to myself, you know, if someone came along here that, you know, poachers or military people that had weapons or anything, it'd be very easy for me to disappear and no one would ever know where I am. But, you know, I crossed that out of my mind right away. And just about after I've had that thought, all of a sudden, it was gunshots that went off right behind me. Boom, 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 like that. And I kind of jumped and said, whoa, boy, I don't know what that's all about. Maybe I shouldn't be out here too much longer. But, you know, I wanted to get the shot, so I leaned back into the camera eyepiece and I was filming this stuff was going along great and all of a sudden this voice right behind me said hey and I jumped and I flinched and I said whoa and I turned around and it was like Joseph who was the Karasoki camp cook and I was kind of relieved at that but he says you come you come and didn't know what was wrong but I just heard all these gunshots I went running back into camp and I went around the corner and it was the Karasoki anti-poaching patrols and they had captured a poacher. Karahezi. Karahezi? Yeah. How old is Karahezi? Does he have a family? Mm. Mm. Yes, he has a family. How many children? Five. Why does he poach? Because not to have uh, something for to eat, something for jacket, for to have uh, the good house, etc. Our men uh, have found an eightfold uh, increase in the number of snares that have been set in the forest. One way we're trying to tackle that problem is with these GPS units. Okay. Mm. 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 Beats me there in the background, joining us. Mm. They will record your exact position on Earth. That's where the global positioning systems. We're going to start tracking the gorillas very accurately as to what their home range is and how they use their habitat. Data collected with global positioning systems is providing scientists with a new view of our world. GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, and it's a relatively new technology. It's a computer-based technology. GIS is the medium that we use to study global environmental issues. So we can study various different kinds of projects, we can do things at a local, a county, a national level, all the way up to studying the entire planet. From the remote sensing side, we had a very serious problem in that this really is the land of gorillas in the mist. There are basically very few maps, very poor maps, 
And most importantly, they didn't have a modern vegetation map that they could use to plot the gorilla movements over time to understand some basic primatology questions of the interaction between the bands of gorillas and the environment that they live in. What we did is uh, I contacted uh, some of my colleagues at NASA to look at the upcoming space shuttle radar missions. Seven, six, five, four, the water Three. Down. Two. The engine starting. One. We have booster ignition and liftoff. Uh, a little twang, and again, uh, when the solid rocket motors uh, ignite, you're going uh, out of town very quickly. It took us eight and a half minutes to get to space. Uh, here come the solid rockets being kicked off the ET. Traditional remote sensing data like Landsat and Spot are systems that are passive in nature, and basically what we see down there all the time is the top of the clouds. And the beautiful thing about radar is it's what we call an active system. It sends its own burst of energy down and records what's reflected off the ground. You can see this is a model of the system we have on board. What we have in the bay here, this large piece is an antenna, and there's another skinny piece on the side that's a second wavelength. We have this 200 foot mast. And on the end is a similar antenna with two different kinds of wavelengths on it. And this is a transmitting receiving antenna, so it gives you sort of a stereoscopic effect of the radar radiating out from this antenna and being received by both antennas, which allows us to get the height data. Overlaid here on the outside is our um, TV cameras out in the payload bay. And on the inside, that little square is the radar. So you can see how much more is revealed by the radar. So it can be used day or night, rain or shine, clouds or clear. And so we were able to acquire cloud-free data sets. And this is what we're using now to produce our vegetation maps of the region. There has been a good collaboration between NASA and the Center for Remote Sensing Center here at Rutgers because for the first time we have a complete picture of the Virunga region. We don't have to worry about the political boundaries. We can worry about the biological boundaries, which is what's important at this point. We also use these uh, global positioning systems for tracking the gorilla movement. because we want to know just what determines how the gorillas move. You know, what space do they need? Is it the type of vegetation they prefer? Or are they avoiding other groups? Or are they avoiding poachers? These are the kinds of questions that we can answer by locating the gorillas and, again, recording their exact location and developing a pattern of their home range use. And that way we can figure out how much land do they need? Comparing old geographic maps to state-of-the-art satellite imagery is revealing. The gorilla sanctuary established in the 1920s is shrinking. The Virunga Conservation Area has been reduced to less than half its original size. You can say in a large number of the cases that um, the number of species is dropping off is about the fourth root of the area. And that is quite well substantiated as a general principle. And that means that when you reduce uh, the area of rainforest, a bit of natural savanna, by uh, 90 percent of its original area, uh, you are bringing into endangerment either uh, immediate extinction or dooming them to early extinction about half of the species living in that uh, environment. I think every scientist I know who works in conservation and biological diversity agrees. The cure-all is habitat preservation. As much of the natural ha uh, habitat as we can uh, manage. So it focuses upon land use proper land use 
that includes space for the rest of life. It's as simple as that. Today, less than 350 mountain gorillas live in the Veronkas. You think about it, think about, you know, the town you live in or the high school you went to or, uh, you know, the college you went to, how many people were in that congregation and in that community and think of an entire species being that size and you get the, some sense of the fragility of it. A unique kinship exists between man and ape. Those who have lived and worked with mountain gorillas recognize this bond. Humans try to identify their culture, their history, by the deeds of their generals, by their wars, and so forth. But so far there has been very little concern about what makes humans do what they do. What is their life really based on? Uh, what traits are inborn? Which one are environmentally induced? Or rather, how do the two interact? Mm -hmm. This is one reason people studied apes. They hoped to get answers by studying a simpler culture. And I mean culture, because apes do have a culture. Each population has its travel routes, it has its daily lifestyle, and so forth. So we hope to learn something about humans by studying the apes. Mountain gorilla groups range in size from four to 30 individuals of all ages. Though individuals differ greatly in size, the resemblance between family members is always striking. Now what researchers did over a period of time, they developed a thing called nose prints. They would take sketches of individuals' noses. And uncannily, a gorilla's nose is much like human fingerprints. No two fingerprints are alike, no two gorilla's noses are alike. Although there'll be great similarities in family members, there are certain creases or indentations in every gorilla's nose that is unique to that individual. Mountain gorillas live in the present. They are nomads living a life unhampered by the weight of possessions. With no schedules to meet or appointments to keep, daily life in the gorilla world is determined by the rumbling of their bellies. Mm. To support their vegetarian lifestyle, males need to eat up to 60 pounds of vegetation a day. Females consume 30 to 40 pounds. And simply put, they eat over 100 different kinds of plants. Um, they are herbivores and depend entirely on plant material. Um, so it's mostly stems and leaves. Uh, most of the plants that they eat are grown on the ground. Um, they climb trees very rarely to get food, but they will go up sometimes for special things. This is actually uh, an interesting setting in that uh, we're sitting just in front of uh, Beats Me, who is uh, the uh, subdominant male, silverback male of this group. Uh, but of course the group is named after him because originally Beats Me was the dominant silverback male. That was Beats Me uh, pig grunting at the youngsters because uh, he wanted the roots. Roots are a very preferred uh, food source. You can see him now, he's pulling up the roots, uh, which he'll be stripping and uh, nibbling on probably for the next uh, uh, few minutes anyway. The forest provides an all-you-can-eat salad bar. This makes for some very big bellies. After a morning of feeding, gorillas take a siesta break.
the rest periods are also times when you can see a lot of interesting social behavior. And one thing you see there is how centrally important meals are in the social lives of the others in their groups, because typically what happens during the siesta is that much or all of a group will cluster around the male or the dominant male just to be close to him. And so there will be females there and young animals, and females may groom each other or groom the male, and young animals are likely to engage in a lot of play, and there's a lot of social interaction that goes on. The gorilla siesta in mid-morning resembles school recess. The rest break is the only extended period of the day when juveniles can play and wander about without danger of falling behind the group. Youngsters are free to roughhouse in their built-in jungle gym. I think the most fun times with the animals were when the little ones would be playing. And they played a lot like young children. I mean, they'll play chase, they'll play king on the mountain, pull each other down off these tussocks of vegetation. What you're looking at is a play session involving uh, uh, Buenge, Ubi Buenge, and uh, probably Umucho. This is a typical kind of play session involving uh, these lianas that hang from trees, much like human children uh, would do in the same kind of circumstance. In fact, you can see that uh, a lot of their behavior resembles that of human behavior, which is, of course, what makes gorillas of such great interest uh, to us in the first place. That's also, one should add, why we desperately want to conserve them. Uh, but many of these behavioral patterns, this uh, kind of swinging around, uh, dangling by limbs and uh, wrestling and chasing, uh, does clearly resemble what human children would do in this kind of setting. And what that, of course, reflects is this, the great similarity in anatomy um, and, and, of course, uh, you could, one could say in, in their brains. Their brains are in many ways similar to ours, and uh, that's why their behavior resembles uh, ours. They're close genetic relatives of ours. One of the biggest sins in science is to attach human feelings and behavior to animals. This is called anthropomorphism. With a new scientific consciousness, old perceptions are changing. Anthropomorphism, I think it's a fake issue. Uh, you cannot, as one being, watch another being without projecting yourself into it, without assuming, if you believe in evolution, that it also has similar emotions, it may see the world in a completely different way. But some of its emotions, some of its feelings, some of its ways of thinking are still going to be similar to ours. And the only way, at any rate, that you can interpret anything about an animal is through your eyes. So to say that you're doing objective science by not anthropomorphizing is uh, dishonest or foolish because you cannot help watching the animals through your eyes, ask questions of that animal through you. So no matter what you do, you're anthropomorphizing. The years I spent with mountain gorillas were extremely special. And in fact, every day was unique. Every day I felt like I learned something from these animals. Every day something new happened. One of the most memorable, I think, to me was being with the family 
the middle of the day, people, people, gorillas were resting. Um, and they'd often be in contact one with another, very social animals. And sitting and feeling, you know, I'm supposed to be the scientist taking my notes and being somewhat um, apart from them all. But Ziz, who grew up to be a fantastic, beautiful silverback, was about eight years old at the time, and came over and sat down near me, and then laid down near me. He put his hand out and just touched, just was just in contact with me. And it's just the kind of thing you would have done to another gorilla in the family. They're often in a link, a chain of one contacting another, touching another, touching another. And there I was part of the family. And that alone, just a very calm moment of being part of the family physically as well, was um, and something I'll never forget. <clears throat> I've had a lot of great days with mountain gorillas, but uh, probably the most amazing day, the most variety of experiences that I ever could imagine was the day that uh, I went out at Karasoki Research Center uh, in Rwanda with Martha Robbins to see Group 5. It's a huge group. Uh, there was about 33 members at that time, and it was led by a big, magnificent silverback named Ziz. And his brother, Shinda, was carrying on that day and exhibiting all kinds of playful but aggressive behavior. And it was wild. Mm -mm. I'm always interested in seeing which females go after him. Like, that female wasn't that juvenile's mother. And I've seen that several occasions where the female will go after him, but it's, it's just whoever's nearby telling him to <laughs> behave himself. Shinda was being uh, playfully aggressive with the juveniles. We were seeing all kinds of things that I'd never seen before. He was racing back and forth in front of me, he was chest beating, and he turned and ran past me, and then he started knuckle walking back across in front of me again, and he stopped. And he turned around right into the camera, and he just stared at me, and he just held it. Now, looking through the viewfinder, Everything seems very safe, but I knew that look was not a good one for me. So I went, uh-oh, I wonder what that's all about. And as soon as I thought that, he softened it, he turned, he started knuckle walking away. So I figured, okay, that's okay. Just went a couple of paces, and all of a sudden, he rose up, he started chest beating, his mouth was yeah. wide open, and he started charging at me. <laughs> In research terms, we try and put the gorillas first and we never try and upset them. So I turned sideways from his charge to defuse the charge. And I started crouching halfway down with the camera because you want to get submissive. Well, when I did that, I turned and the camera was like blocking my vision. So I could not see where Shinda was. I knew he was close, but I'd only crouched into a half crouch. And I, I said, I can't hold this crouch much longer. I'm going to go down fully. As Soon as I started moving down, boom, 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 he hit me. Mm -hmm. I went down on the ground. Next thing I know, I had this incredible weight on top of me. It felt like I had a refrigerator on top of me. Didn't know what it was, but I had a pretty good idea that it was Shinda. So first thing that happened was I thought I couldn't breathe because I was getting crushed. So I shuffled around to make sure that, you know, I was going to be able to get oxygen at least. And as soon as I knew, okay, I can breathe, I just decided to relax because I knew that would diffuse any kind of aggression that you might have. So I just relaxed. But I'm laying there facing the dirt, you know, camera's in the dirt. I got this big weight on top of me. And the next thing I know, I have this hand going like this on my head. And I knew it wasn't Martha. This was Shinda. So I said, well, this is pretty interesting. Next thing I know, I got this wet nose 
in my ear going, and it was Shunda. And he was like sizing me up. And he's taking down all this data into his gorilla brain saying, I will remember Phil the next time. So I was laying there being submissive. And the next thing I knew, Martha's voice came over to me and said, I think you better try and grab your camera because Shinda's going to try and take it. So here I am laying underneath this 350-pound gorilla. Didn't quite know what to do, so I said, okay. So I reached up, grabbed the camera strap, and when I did, he saw my hand come up and he yanked at the camera. And, and what it did, in effect, was like brought me right up to a sitting position right next to Shinda. I mean, we were shoulder to shoulder. His face was right here. So I turned, I looked at Shinda. He looked away. He turned back, looked at me. I look away. So everything is it's pretty cool right at that moment. But I knew if he decided to run with the camera, there's nothing I was going to do to stop him. Uh, they, they think that uh, a mature gorilla has the strength of eight Olympic weightlifters. So this camera was going into the jungle, never to be seen again if I let him go with it. So he started getting curious with the camera. He started looking the camera over, and he started kind of, you know, got interested in that. So I figured, this is my time. And so right when he let go of the camera, he was just getting ready to look up back at me again. And when he did, I went, ah, ah, like that, which is in gorilla terms is a, is a you know, command to, like, stop it. And all of a sudden, he just let go of the camera like that, and he just turned and looked at me, like, almost as if to say, how did you know that? You know, and, and, and then he got this expression on his face, was like, gee, I'm sorry, uh, you know, that I, I did this to you. I hope I didn't hurt you. And then he just kind of got up and, like, moseyed off into the jungle and left me with a camera, and I was sitting there going, like, wow, you know, this is something I will never, ever forget. But it's obvious that Shinda was feeling something. Well, gorillas and most animals communicate in some way. They keep their group cohesive. They express their emotions with actions, sounds, gestures, and so forth. But there's no evidence that gorillas can tell you about the past and the future. And there's no evidence that they tell it to each other. So, yes, they have a culture in that if they pick up a certain trait, the youngster learns it from its mother and it can go on generation to generation. But nobody tells that youngster why they're doing that. So there's a real gap in comprehension. But this doesn't mean the gorillas aren't perfectly well adapted and integrated and communicate amongst themselves what is going on. And people can learn to some extent what gorillas are thinking, just like you can learn from your dog what it wants and what it is thinking. You can have empathy with the animals. You can, in certain level, communicate with them. I suppose that everyone, or virtually everyone, who meets mountain gorillas in the wild is awed by how magnificent they are and, and by a sense of kinship that they have with these animals. Those of us who are fortunate enough to spend a lot of time there and really to get to know the animals well are also struck by the fact that we go through a process of getting to know them, getting familiar with their behavior and getting to know them at individuals and then realize once we reach a certain point that they've been doing the same thing with us. <clears throat> One early experience that I had that started to bring that message home but also I have always remembered as just a startling illustration of how tolerant the gorillas are of our presence. Um, happened when I had gone to group five for one of the first times by myself. So now I, 
I knew them well enough and was comfortable enough being close to them that I could do that confidently. But I didn't know them too well yet. And I was busy collecting data on what the gorillas were eating and other fascinating subjects. And I was following Puck, who was then a young adult female. And Puck was extremely comfortable with people. So I could get close to her, and she didn't mind that I was there. But what happened was she climbed onto a fallen tree trunk. And this was an enormous hagenia tree, and the trunk, the top of the trunk was about level with my eyes. Um, and she sat up there for a while eating galium, which is one of their favorite foods, a vine that was growing all over the tree trunk. And she finished what she wanted there and climbed over the trunk and disappeared over the other side. She was out of my view. And I assumed she had climbed down and was moving off on the other side. And to keep up with her, I realized I needed to climb over the tree trunk too. So I started to do that. And I got up and just put my head over the top and discovered that she had not gone down to the ground. She'd climbed down to what was, in effect, a ledge on the other side and was sitting there eating more gallium. And she wasn't happy suddenly to have me looming on top of her like that. And her response was, move her hand quickly in my direction while going <coughs> and giving me a really dirty look. And the <coughs> is a mildly aggressive vocalization. And my response was, to be startled and intimidated and um, give her you know, classic fright reaction, at which, which she read and at which she immediately changed her expression. And from going like that to push me away, she softened it to sort of like this, with her fingers down, and um, gave me an expression more like this, like as if she was saying, now, now, I'm not, I'm not going to hurt you, but I just don't want you doing that. So don't do it again, please. And I will never forget that. Gorillas, like humans, are very expressive animals. Human eyes can show anger, fear, uh, gentleness, a whole range of emotions. Not just the eyes, but the skin around the eyes. And it's the same with gorillas. If you sit and watch a gorilla, you can see the changing emotions going back and forth depending on what is thinking. And I think that is as close as you can get to what gorillas are responding to. We came upon the group as they were all centered around the body of Imbaraga. We stayed with the group for about uh, an hour or two watching how the group interacted, how they dealt with the presence of the, of the body of their former leader. And uh, many of the animals circled in and out to come up to the body, to touch him. Some of the animals were poking him almost as if they were trying to arouse him uh, from his sleep. And um, there were a few animals that got up on top of him and jumped up and down. And, that was a, a hard thing for us to watch. Um, finally, after, after about uh, an hour or so, the group started to move off. When we had, we had first arrived with the group, all of the, the rest of the group was there. They started to move off. Um, they were off feeding. And a few of the animals stayed behind, including one sub-adult male named Imfubi. And as we watched, he ended up being the last animal to stay there with the body. He stayed there and sat right next to the dead body of Imbaraga for about half an hour. The last um, 15 minutes or so, he laid, laid down with his head touching Imbaraga's head and uh, just stayed there. And very, very slowly, he then got up and moved off in the direction of the group, but he was moving very, very slowly. We were in a clearing. He got to the edge of the clearing and stopped and turned around and looked over his shoulder and took one last look, it seemed. and. Uh, then uh, headed off slowly in the direction of the group. And uh, it was a, a very hard thing to watch. It was uh, as if he was very, very close to Imbaraga and was having a difficult time leaving and accepting the fact that he wasn't going to get up and follow him. So he stopped to take a last look and then moved on. And uh, it was a very difficult thing to watch. Death is one thing, but an end to birth 
is something else. If you think about a ship that has many, many rivets in it to hold the ship together, and if you pretend that each rivet represents a species of animal, on that ship some rivets may pop out at any period of time, and the ship may still stay together. But if you think of each rivet as a species, we are losing species every day, but at some point we may lose so many that the whole system may fall apart. And in terms of preserving any species, that species is part of an overall system uh, or a balance of nature in its environment. So even if you, you lose one species, you're affecting the overall system. The current rate of extinction is alarming. Eminent Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson estimates that we are losing at least three to four species an hour. In our lifetime, we may see the extinction of one third of all species on the planet. The mountain gorilla could be among these. We should bear in mind when we talk about species extinction that uh, we're not uh, dealing here with just the plucking out of one element you know, like a pixel out of a picture. But we are, uh, it's more like pulling a string out of a fabric. Because the species, uh, that uh, almost all species are connected uh, to other species by multiple relationships. Each species is here today because it has been created in a crucible of intense competition and environmental pressure. And as a consequence, its tens of thousands of genes uh, are, represent a masterpiece of adaptation. Each species is exquisitely adapted to the environment in which you find it, and that has almost always a natural environment in which you find it. So that is what we are destroying, or allowed, allowing to be destroyed, when we let species go extinct. Another reason for caring about the loss of species, even in a remote part of the world, is that the diversity of species, the variety, the numbers of species around the world matter in terms of the stability of the biosphere, this film of life in which we live and on which we depend. That's a well-established principle now in ecology. But the more species you have, the more resiliency you have in that biosphere, both locally and on a worldwide basis. If you take away more and more species, you're making the world that we depend upon, the natural world, less and less able to respond to stresses, including the ones we are putting on it, and therefore unstable, and therefore more dangerous to us as a species. So we have to say to our fellow human beings, do you really want these species to be eliminated because they're not going to be replaced. People have asked me, well, why don't we just say people? I mean, people are the endangered species here. Um, why care about animals uh, when it comes down to it? When the, when the crunch hits, uh, let's save ourselves. My reaction to that is always uh, kind of amazement that anybody just could not see um, the, the problem on the larger scale. I'm really talking about a feeling about the world and the world we live in that we are not alone as a species even though we think we are, uh, that there are uh, a dozen other species that are sensitive, intelligent, conscious, uh, aware in much um, the same universe that we live in. And if we were to find these species on another planet, we would be completely amazed and awed if we had think we had discovered intelligent life, which we would have. And yet they're here and we just essentially ignore them because we're familiar with them. If at present something doesn't have a dollar value, is it valueless? You have put a price on everything and know the value of nothing. People have to make a decision what they want. They have to decide on their options for their future. They have to decide do we want to keep gorillas as part of our natural and cultural heritage? If the answer is yes, that means you have to set limits. This area will be protected and we will do everything possible to protect it. 
Unless you do that, you will lose the gorillas. You can never, ever turn your back on these animals because as soon as you do, some catastrophe will eliminate them. So if you're talking about conservation of gorillas, we're not talking about one generation. We're talking in terms of centuries forevermore. More than ever, the survival of the mountain gorilla and the Varunga ecosystem depends upon the willingness of humans to embrace conservation as an economic, ecological, and moral priority. Animals are beings that share the life with us. It gives great pleasure to observe them, to learn to understand them, and it is also essential for their survival in the future as well as for our survival. We're all bound together on this small planet. And unless we take care of it, what is our future going to be like? Another major benefit that the natural world offers us on top of all the others is uh, mystery. Human beings need mystery. They need um, something in their lives within reach that is so complex and rich and un unexplored that it uh, excites the imagination. And it excites it in ways that they personally can experience and follow. And that's what life on this planet offers us. The more that you know something of great value like that, the more you want to learn. And the more you learn, the more you come to care for it, even love for it, love it. My study of the mountain gorillas was about 35 years ago. That makes me an old silverback male in the history of gorillas and among gorillas. In fact, it's, it's a rather lovely thought that some of the gorillas that I knew as babies are probably still alive. So it's not that long ago. But my wife and I never really left the gorillas because we hear let us say, a woodpecker drumming a log. In the distance, it sounds like a gorilla chest beating. So even though I haven't worked on gorillas for decades, I'm still involved with them. And that gives me great pleasure, if for no other reason. After all the tribulations that part of the world has gone through, they are surviving, and that is an important thing. <laughs>